So this lecture is going to look at um, sort of the state of the economy in England post-plague um, and then move into the reign of Richard II, which faced um, a number of challenges, including uh, the Peasants' Revolt and also uh, sort of baronial rebellion. So um, in late medieval England, so you do have a situation where the... Um, the entire sort of continent has been impacted and England has been as well due to uh, all the impacts of the plague that uh, have been addressed. In some ways though, that decreased population after the plague does relieve some of that internal pressure that was being caused by overpopulation and land shortages. So um, there is some opportunity for those who survived to sort of rebuild. We do see in England, um, an economy increasingly reliant on the wool trade, um, particularly with Flanders. So this is modern Belgium, so right across the channel. They're exporting something like 30,000 sacks of wool every year. So whenever there are sort of disruptions of that trade, it's going to have a negative impact on the English economy. And also the shift to reliance on wool is also going to encourage some people to replace um, arable land that's subject to agriculture with pasture, and that's going to have implications moving forward. However, um, one of the things that we do know is that the infrastructure uh, was still very much in place. So communication is actually much more um, sort of reliable and efficient than one might think uh, in terms of sort of getting written communications from one side of England to the other. Um, also, they have a very active um, sort of infrastructure for trade. So coastal shipping, also uh, a lot of the rivers, the internal rivers were used to move goods from place to place. And then you've got um, just shy of sort of 3,000 miles of roads. Um, some of them have been there since Roman times. Some of them have been added. Uh, some of them have been improved upon. But so this is the Gulf map of England. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of how populated it is, um, as well as sort of how they envisioned uh, the sort of the topography itself. So um, Richard II is the second son of Edward, the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales and um, his wife, Joan of Kent. Uh, they had an older son who died when he was about six. So Richard is clearly then next in line to the throne. Um, Prince Edward becomes increasingly ill uh, after 1370. We're not sure exactly what. Um, it, just, it could be uh, all the extensive campaigns, um, but he is in decline for quite some time. And um, obviously then, that is going to create some uh, sort of questions about succession, particularly because during this period, um, King Edward III uh, is actually sort of in declining health as well. Um, he's not really able to assert his authority at court. There are a number of people that try and sort of step up into that power vacuum. Um, so there's a lot of sort of jockeying for positions there. Eventually in 1376, um, Edward does die. This is uh, Joan of Kent pictured here, his widow, who tries to sort of provide a sort of a stabilizing force at court, knowing that um, her young son Richard is next in line for the throne. Um, we do also see Edward III's younger brother, John of Gaunt, um, who is an extraordinarily powerful noble within England, uh, try and sort of assume some of the responsibility for governing, but um, he's actually sort of resisted by the people who've managed to infiltrate Edward III's court, um, particularly his mistress, and are trying to sort of, um, uh, sort of become rich uh, at, at the king's expense. We also see during this period, in part because of the decline of the king's health and the decline of uh, Prince Edward's health, um, is unsuccessful um, adventures in France. And so increasingly, the French are able to, little by little, uh, regain a lot of the territory that they lost in the first phase of the Hundred Years' War. And so it's really just the port city of Calais that the English control. So in 1377, Edward III dies, and um, young Richard is uh, crowned the next king. He is only 10, so they are absolutely going to need some sort of um, government, a regent, a council, until he comes of age, which is going to be at least four or five years. Um, his mother, Joan of Kent, um, while she is providing this sort of stabilizing force, she doesn't really have the background in terms of stepping up and being a regent. 
Um, John of Gaunt, his uncle, does have the experience, but in part because he's so wealthy, there's a lot of suspicion about um, some of his intentions, um, and so the, a lot of the other nobles are really hesitant to let him uh, assume that much power. So what they end up doing is just sort of um, configuring this series of sort of continual councils for the next few years. So some of the major um, leaders of the church and some of the major barons uh, who sort of come together and provide an advisorial council for young Richard, who's pictured here at the day of his coronation. Um, one of the things that uh, they do want to do is to continue to pursue the war with France. This obviously means that they're going to need money, and so Parliament is summoned. Um, in 1377, there is a poll tax that Parliament approves. This is an across-the-board tax, so four pence per person in your family. So each household has to uh, come up with this much money. And this uh, tax, which is a very unpopular tax, um, Previously, taxes have been a little bit more of a sliding scale, so the wealthier um, tend to contribute a little bit more, but this is a flat tax, and so everybody has to pay the same amount, and so it does raise a lot of um, opposition amongst uh, sort of the peasants who feel that it's unfairly distributed. On 1378, there's another tax on movable property, um, also very unfair, uh, according to the peasants. Um, you do end up having sort of widespread evasion of some of these taxes. Uh, so it's not clear actually how much people ended up having to contribute, but they do um, sort of uh, intersect with a lot of frustration on the part of uh, the peasant class, um, particularly in the wake of the plague. In spite of all the money that these taxes do raise, the military gains of uh, the English army are very, very minimal. So they come back from these campaigns with very little to show for it. So all of this then provides the context for the revolt that happens in 1381. Um, this is a really a significant moment, I think, not so much because of what changes, but more because this is really the first time you have this um, this vocal articulation across large demographic groups within England that the system is unfair um, and demands for real change. In part, this is directly connected to the plague. So for those individuals who survived the plague, um, they've been able to take advantage of some of these economic opportunities that have opened up for them, sort of um, inheriting more land uh, from deceased relatives, uh, the increase in wages that happens as a result of um, decreased supply of labor. Unfortunately, uh, the nobility is not happy about some of these shifts, and it's not so much that the nobility aren't still profiting, they are, um, but they want to profit more. And so in 1352, one of the um, uh, one of the sort of the parliaments passes a statute of laborers, which attempts to unilaterally return wages to pre-plague levels. So ignore the sort of um, natural uh, operations of supply and demand. For the most part, there's no enforcement. It's very difficult to do this, but it certainly reflects the lack of um, sort of a sympathy that the upper classes feel for the peasants who are trying to recover from plague. Then in 1381, these series of taxes really shift the burden to peasants and wage laborers. So these are some of the poll taxes and the, and the flat taxes that I mentioned, and that creates a lot of anger. Um, in part, evasion of these taxes is very widespread, in part because people feel that they're unfair. And so then the government responds with some really harsh enforcement attempts. And so that sort of is a further catalyst to this anger. Um, this is an image. So Foissart, once again, is um, an eyewitness source for a lot of these events. And so this is an image of um, John Ball, who becomes one of the leaders of um, these peasants in um, their attempt to sort of challenge some of these structures. And what's so interesting about John Ball is he's a priest. He's a local priest. Um, and he gives a sermon where he talks about how the system is unfair. And one of the famous quotes attributed to John Ball is when Adam delved and Eve span, who was the gentleman? So in other words, why do we even have this nobility? How can they keep saying that this structure has been put in place by God? Because I'm not seeing it reflected in the Bible. 
So what happens next is um, a number of preachers like John Ball uh, sort of travel through some of these small villages, uh, making connections between some of the anger felt by the local population and um, the need to perhaps um, uh, to communicate with the king. Now, they um, then end up sort of marching en masse. Most of these um, peasants come from southeast England, and the March on London is actually very organized and very deliberate. This is not a mob. Um, the violence is really very minimal. Interestingly, um, what they target is they'll go into a local manor and they'll break into the manor house, but they won't steal anything except the documents that um, have recorded sort of the servitude of various peasants. So they deliberately destroy um, those sort of physical records of serfdom as a way to try and abolish the practice itself. Um, they do not question the authority of the king. However, they do question the authority of the nobles. Um, and so one of the demands they articulate is um, abolish all uh, sort of um, all of the noble offices below the king and then completely redistribute all of the land. These are not like the poorest sort of members of medieval society. They're actually the people who've been able to sort of improve their situation post-plague. So these are the local office holders of a village, the people who've achieved some sort of standing. Um, peasants who have managed to sort of really improve their standard of living as a result of um, some of these economic situations post-plague. They do when they get to London, attack uh, some of the individuals who they feel sort of represent this system. You can see that here. Um, so the Archbishop of Canterbury is uh, executed. Also, they really don't like John of Gaunt. In particular, he's been sort of active in some of this enforcement and um, a lot of his properties are targeted. Um, and then some Flemish merchants who also sort of represent to them um, sort of lost opportunities. So they are amassed, this army of peasants, right outside of London. They do burn down some buildings. Uh, King Richard and his council at the time seek refuge within the Tower of London. Um, and then they have to kind of figure out what's going to happen next. So the king is only 14 at the time. So how is he going to sort of address uh, this, this real challenge and this revolt? Um, there are two sort of uh, possibilities. Um, one is uh, to sort of uh, to negotiate with the peasants and the other one is some sort of armed military retribution. And um, Richard seems more inclined um, and perhaps this is because he's only 14, but he seems more inclined to enter into negotiations. Um, and so on the 14th of June, uh, he meets with some of the, um, the leaders of uh, this sort of revolt. He promises to grant them everything they want um, and uh, that he will abolish serfdom. They want sort of um, standardized rents across England. He says, sure. They want punishment for traitors. They don't really identify who those traitors are. He says, sure. Um, they seem to have a very productive meeting. He goes back to the Tower of London. They, the leaders go back to the crowds and say, look, the king's given us everything we wanted. Isn't he a great king? Um, shortly after that, however, he meets with um, another of the leaders of this group, a man named Watt Tyler. And he meets with Watt Tyler at Smithfield, which is also a plain sort of right outside of the city. Um, and uh, there is a lot of sort of... Um, conflict within his inner council about whether or not the king should be negotiating with these uh, with these peasants. Some people feel like his sort of previous meeting uh, just served to sort of embolden them. It's not totally clear what happens. We know that initially Richard um, begins to um, engage in the same tactics, just giving uh, promises, telling Watt Tyler he can have whatever he wants. However, at a particular instance, um, there's a scuffle Somebody from Richard's retinue uh, stabs Watt Tyler, and then as soon as he falls from his horse, other members of Richard's household sort of um, attack him and kill him. And then this is sort of a really a key pivotal moment. There's a lot of confusion amongst Tyler's followers because they can't see what happened. 
And so Richard really very much takes the initiative. He rides directly into this um, army of peasants and he leads them uh, deliberately away from the city, away from potential targets of destruction right outside of the city and he says look yeah tyler's gone but i'm your new leader um and i'm the person who's going to be responsible for you so um in part then with tyler gone and seemingly getting everything they wanted with these concessions from the king um it's really unclear what should happen next so um those armies uh, sort of begin to then gradually return to their villages the sort of organized element of the revolt collapses there are some small pockets of resistance. And so eventually um, uh, members of the king's military go out into the countryside and begin to sort of um, quell any remaining uh, rebellions and reestablish authority. For the most part, um, the retribution is pretty minimal. Um, some fines for some of these leaders, but actually few sort of executions. Um, and it does get the House of Commons to sort of bring up this idea that perhaps we need to reform the way taxes happen. Perhaps we need to take another look at um, how serfdom continues to sort of work. Um, they don't really achieve much in terms of actual change, but the immediate poll tax that was the catalyst for this whole revolt is eventually dropped. In contrast, there are similar revolts across France, um, and this is an illustration of those. They are much more brutal, bloody, and violent. And so you have a situation where, um, in contrast to the organized sort of rebellions in England, in France, you just have sort of armed mobs of peasants marching from castle to castle, breaking in, looting, burning, killing, raping, and destroying. And so um, the royal authority in France takes a little bit longer uh, to sort of reestablish control. So although he successfully sort of um, addresses the peasant revolt, uh, Richard also, as he asserts himself um, as king and um, begins to take on more and more responsibility for government, has other challenges from amongst his own barons. In part, Richard seems to embrace um, an understanding of royal authority that the English haven't seen in quite some time. He has a very clear... Um, belief that he has a divine mandate from God and that uh, this sort of shift in the balance of power that's happened over the previous few generations where these barons, these wealthy nobles have become more and more powerful at the king's expense needs to be adjusted, that he needs to, to reclaim a lot more authority and he needs to really subject these barons um, to his own sort of governance. In 1380, he demisses his regency council and um, increasingly is surrounded by individuals who profess loyalty and support. So this court party emerges. Um, he does. He is married by this time. His wife is Anne of Bohemia. He seems to be very, very devoted to her. Um, she's sort of part of this inner circle. He sort of targets a lot of these followers then with wealth and gifts, earldoms and offices. Um, there also are, um, he's very much into pageantry. There's a lot of money uh, spent on uh, sort of clothing, especially luxury items, um, throwing banquets at court, putting on um, various plays at court. And so all of this costs money and um, parliament isn't happy about it. There are a group of um, nobles then who sort of appeal some of their um, frustrations to, uh, to the court. And so they become known as the Lord's Appellant. And this particular group is really critical of the way um, Richard is spending money. So um, increasingly as he um, mismanages funds, as he sort of uh, spends money he doesn't have, his position is weakened. And so in 1386, Parliament is called to renew um, a, question, a, a, a consideration for a tax to deplete his funds. And instead of doing that, they actually threaten to depose him for mismanagement. And Richard is forced to sort of leave London. Um, he makes some initial concessions about um, perhaps a, a new royal household, um, that, he, that there's going to be someone to provide oversight for the revenue that he's spending. Um, but he's just not interested. And so he ignores the council and um, hopes that he can just make it all go away.
This is a picture of John of Gaunt, who is one of the leading voices within this group of Lords Appellant. So in 1388 then, uh, Richard attempts to sort of uh, defeat this baronial challenge um, at the Battle of Radcott Bridge, which you can see pictured here. His forces are defeated, and so he's forced to return to London and to submit to the demands of the Lord's Appellant. And so the Parliament that's held during this period is referenced as the Merciless Parliament. It charges a lot of Richard's sort of inner circle with treason. Many of them are executed, a lot of them are just exiled, um, and it appoints a new sort of council uh, of, comprised of many of these barons to sort of provide that oversight of government, uh, particularly of finances, uh, that they had called for previously. And this is really sort of the high point of Parliament's power during the rule of Richard. Um, John of Gaunt, as I said, is sort of an active participant in this. Um, but there are a number of barons who are very suspicious of John of Gaunt's motives. Um, remember, we're just sort of one generation removed from the deposition of Edward II um, by Parliament, who was accused of a lot of the same um, sort of violations that Richard II is being accused of. So some people are suspicious that perhaps John of Gaunt, who does have a claim to the throne, is trying to sort of position himself um, as Richard's successor. So there comes a period um, from 1389, that uh, should say to 13, it's not 1389 to 1389, um, from 1389 to about 1396, where Richard does become sort of increasingly um, inclined to cooperate with his counselors. Some of this seems to be the response to the death of his wife, Anne, uh, who we think dies of plague, um, and he is he's very bereft. Um, also, though, um, in part, to avoid these clashes with Parliament, he tries to avoid the need for revenue. And so he ends the war with France, which actually um, angers a lot of uh, English nobles because they were um, profiting considerably from the war with France. He also marries Isabella, the daughter of King Charles IV of France. Isabella is considerably younger, as you can see from this image here of Isabella and Richard. She's like five or six. He's like 27. Um, he is not particularly anxious to get an heir, so he feels that the economic and diplomatic of these uh, advantages of this marriage outweigh his need um, to produce an heir because he knows he's going to have to wait a while before he can consummate the marriage with Isabella. However, she does bring a really large dowry, and so that dowry fills his treasury and um, provides him the, all of the funds that he needs to continue to sort of um, uh, provide for his court without going to Parliament. However, as he tries to sort of really just avoid any clashes with Parliament, um, nobles are sort of moving um, uh, sort of behind the scenes to turn uh, the tables on him. And so one of the things that Parliament's doing is um, increasingly filling its ranks with anti-royalists, with people who sort of support the cause of the barons. Um, you do see then um, some of the uh, inner circle around Richard um, uh, begin to uh, accuse barons of treason. Um, he confiscates, um, in, in response to uh, what he considers to be this baronial challenge, Richard accuses a number of these barons within Parliament of treason. Many of them he has executed, um, including um, the Duke of Gloucester, uh, who's actually smothered in his sleep. Um, he's a member of the royal family. The Earl of Arundel is executed. The Duke of Warwick is exiled. Um, and so Richard, one by one, moves against all of these very, very high-ranking nobles within England, um, in spite of the fact that, that he's actually related to many of them. Perhaps his boldest move is um, he exiles his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, who's pictured here. Henry Bolingbroke is the son of, the, is of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. Henry Bolingbroke is exiled uh, for what he's accused of, these treasonous actions. While he's in France, his father, the Duke of Lancaster, dies. And so 
his estate should pass to Henry Bolingbroke. However, Richard intervenes and prevents that from happening. And he confiscates all the wealth and possessions of, um, that are associated with the Duchy of Lancaster. And this sort of more than anything really unsettles a lot of the nobility who've been kind of on the fence. Um, one of the sort of fundamental rights that they claim and have claimed for some time is the right to inherit fiefs, for these fiefs to pass from father to son. Maybe you have to pay some money, but that right has never been disputed. And the fact that without really any proof, the king has sort of um, uh, challenged that hereditary right makes everybody else very, very nervous. So um, in 1399, Richard invades Ireland in an attempt to sort of establish his authority there. And Henry Bolingbroke uses that opportunity to lead a small force into England. He initially claims that um, he is just there to get back his inheritance, what is his by right. But as more and more nobles kind of flock to his standard, his ambitions seem to shift. And then increasingly, you start to hear accusations um, that Richard is unfit to rule, that Richard is um, uh, not sort of managing the uh, government effectively. Um, and so more and more then, these barons sort of rally to the side of Henry Bolingbroke. Richard is um, returns to England he is um, seeking refuge, refuge in Conwy Castle, which is in Wales. He realizes the vulnerability of his position. He does not have an army. He does not have much money. He is tempted to flee once he sees um, sort of uh, the weakness of his position. But Henry Bolingbroke and the other nobles convince him to come to the table for negotiations. So they sort of lure him out of Conwy Castle. They really have no intention of negotiating. Um, they tell him they want him to abdicate. He tells them he's not willing to. He starts to leave and they actually ambush him and then imprison him um, and lock him up in Pontefract Castle. And this is an image of Richard sort of agreeing to uh, abdication and then being led off eventually to Pontefract. Um, what this really does, and this uh, this genealogy is intended to illustrate it, is create a whole host of consequences here for the royal family moving forward. Richard is unquestionably um, the right successor according to the rules of primogenitor. The other person who actually has, um, a, if, if Richard is not in the position, then the next strongest claim to the throne um, is the line of the Duke of Clarence, sort of Lionel. Um, whose son Edmund Mortimer uh, has just recently died. So he, there is no adult claimant for um, that sort of second eldest Yorkist line. You can see John of Gaunt and his son Henry Bolingbroke, who do eventually claim the throne, are further down. And so this is going to create um, a lot of instability moving forward about the rightful, um, who has the rightful claim to the throne. In the meantime, in 1399, Henry IV is crowned king. Um, shortly after that, Richard mysteriously dies. Um, most of the accounts that we have seem to suggest he's starved to death. No one actually wants to be the person who kills a living king. Um, so they kind of do it that way. This is Pontefract Castle where he uh, ends his days. Um, Bolingbroke, however, so now Henry IV realizes that um, he is very dependent upon the will and uh, the loyalty of the nobles. And so we do see um, this uh, increasingly the king sort of reaching out to the nobility, um, sort of moving away from Richard's claims to absolute authority. We also see one of the reasons why Richard seemed to find himself in the position that he did was he never really had the um, sort of support of uh, the common people the way some of his ancestors did. This could be because he wasn't really terribly invested in pursuing the war with France. Uh, it could also be that he sort of really was sort of isolated from the common people. He didn't um, sort of allow them to have access to him that some of his predecessors did. But this idea of really having sort of the popular support of the people, even though this is by no means an elective sort of government, um, is still gonna be important moving forward. 
And then questioning the sort of hereditary principles of succession. What's going to happen moving forward? This is the first time, although we've had some disruption, um, this is the first time within the Plantagenet dynasty that you don't have strict primogenitor father-son succession. So even um, Edward II was killed, but he was replaced by his own son. And sort of this move by Henry of Bolingbroke is going to sort of really throw a curveball um, into succession leading towards the very end of medieval England.